Good evening, I'm Michelle Leifer, and as the director of the UZAN Institute for Animal Health Education at the Schwarzman Animal Medical Center, I am delighted to welcome you to tonight's event, Play With Your Cat with Dr. Michael Maria Delgado. We are recording tonight's event and a link will be sent out tomorrow so you can revisit the presentation or share it with friends who may have missed it. We'll be taking questions through chat and we'll reserve time at the end to answer as many as we can. I'd like to take a quick moment to highlight an upcoming event. On Thursday, April 4th at 6 p.m., veterinary behaviorists from the Cornell University College of Veterinary Medicine will join us to discuss cognitive dysfunction syndrome in senior pets. Details and registration are available on our website at amcny.org events, and further information will be included in tonight's newsletter. So for those of you who joined us last year for Dr. Delgado's How to Make Your Cat Happy webinar, it's wonderful to have you back. Um, we are thrilled to host Dr. Delgado again as she shares insights from her brand new book, which I have read and highly recommend. Um, and in celebration of the book's release, she is kind enough to give away three free copies of Play With Your Cat to randomly chosen attendees. So this opportunity is available only to U.S. residents, um, and the, the giveaway entry link will be in the follow-up email, which we will send out tomorrow. And now, without further ado, um, it's my pleasure to introduce Dr. Michael Marie Delgado. Um, she is a certified cat behavior consultant, animal behavior scientist, and author. Um, she's renowned globally as a cat expert. Um, she's been featured by top media outlets, including the BBC, NPR, The Washington Post, The New York Times, National Geographic, The Atlantic, Newsweek, and Scientific American, to name just a few. Um, she lives in Sacramento, California, with her boyfriend, Scott, and their three rescue cats, Coriander, Professor Scribbles, and Ruby. So let's give a warm welcome to Dr. Michael Maria Delgado. Thank you, Michelle, and thank you everyone for being here. I'm really excited to, um, this is basically my book release party, so um, I'm excited to be sharing this time with you. Uh, my book came out last week, if you have not seen it. Um, as mentioned, we will be doing a little giveaway, so, um, and for those of you that are not in the U.S., if you happen to be in the U.K., iCatCare is going to be doing a giveaway in the U.K. this weekend, so um, follow them, if or you can follow me if you want more details on that, uh, mainly the restrictions are around shipping. So um, apologies to those of you who are not in the US or not in the UK, but um, hopefully my book will be available in other places soon. Okay, so I'm going to share my screen so I can get started. So give me just a second. There's always that technology moment. Um, Michelle, can you give me a thumbs up if everything looks good on your end? Excellent. Okay. That's right, yeah. Great, thank you so much and thank you. Uh, Schwarzman Animal Medical Center for hosting me again. I was so excited that they invited me back for this talk. So uh, just to give you a heads up, it's going to be, I'm going to talk a little bit about some of the content in the book and some of the science behind the book, but it is going to be somewhat informal. We're going to look at lots of cute videos of cats playing, which let's face it, that's what we'd all rather be doing than just listening to me lecture for an hour. So um, I'm going to use those videos to kind of highlight some of the things that I want to um, share with you about play. And before I get started, I did want to just acknowledge a few people who are kind of instrumental in this work. I've been focused on cat play for the last, um, I was thinking about it. Um, well, of course, I've been working with cats for almost 25 years. So play has always been a component of how I work with cats and how I encourage clients to interact with their cats. But from a more like academic, like nerdy science perspective, it started in 2017 when my friend Julie Hecht and I decided to write a scientific review paper together about cat play. And that entailed basically like reading all of the science about cat behavior and extracting everything we knew about cat play behavior. We published that paper two years later in 2019. So just so you know, science moves kind of slowly, takes some time. Um, I have uh, the name of the paper here. If you cannot access it online, you can always reach out to me. Scientists are always happy to share their work. And sometimes it's not uh, publicly available or it's behind a paywall. So just know if there's ever a scientific paper that you want to read, the best thing to do is reach out to the author and they're more than happy to share their work with you. Anyway, she was really um, a collaborator with me in that scientific endeavor, you know, and, and after that, I was like, hmm, it would be really cool to translate this material into something that was much more easy to understand, 
maybe even fun to read. And that really spawned my idea for my book. And of course, um, working as a scientist, you always have people mentoring and supporting you. And so Dr. Tony Muff Buffington was my mentor at UC Davis, Dr. John Bradshaw, who I'll be highlighting some of his research on cat play during this presentation, was another person who offered a lot of support and um, review of some of the content that I wrote with that paper uh, with Julie, as well as my book. And then Lily Chin and I worked on a handout together on cat play that I'll be sharing with you later in this presentation, how you can access and download that handout for free. And she illustrated my book. And if you're not familiar with her work, she has her own book about cats called Kitty Language that she published last year. She's a fantastic illustrator. I can't speak highly enough about her art and how both cute and engaging it is, as well as accurate and really great at depicting cat behavior. So without further ado, let's talk about play. Okay, so why are we here tonight? Well, besides celebrating my book, really I wanted to share with you kind of some thoughts about play behavior in animals. And it's something that we don't necessarily give a lot of thought to, um, you know, but all animals do it from birds to bees, to cows, to cats, to humans. So we're gonna talk a little bit about how we define play in the scientific literature. I'm going to talk specifically about hunting behavior in cats and how it relates to play. And I'm going to talk about why cats play and why they need play. And so I'll be really hopefully driving home the importance of play. And then the last majority of the talk is really going to be, again, watching cat videos and some of the things that I've found helpful, especially when cats are challenging to play with, which is something I hear from a lot of people. Okay, so what is play behavior? And Ooh, it's not. Oh, there it is. Okay, so this um, GIF, some of you may have seen this GIF of a crow sliding down a roof in the snow, um, and we see behavior like this, and to us, it looks fun. Like, this is something that kids do, right? When I was a kid, I lived in a snowy area and spent a lot of time sledding in the winter, and when we see this behavior in animals, it's like, hmm, what are they doing? Like, does this behavior seem life-supporting or serious or have anything to do with survival? Not necessarily. Um, and so people have been thinking about this question in animals for a long time, like what exactly is play? How do you how do you define it in animals? And some scientists and papers have literally kind of hinted at like, you know it when you see it, but if you're a scientist, you really want some concrete objective descriptions of what constitutes play. And Dr. Gordon Burghardt is a researcher who he, his focus was play in amphibians. So he studied play behavior in snakes. And you can imagine if you study play behavior in snakes, you're pretty serious about play because I don't know, I, I would not have been thinking about snakes as the most playful animals, but um, he's discovered and um, elaborated on play in all animals. Um, and he came up with these kind of five criteria that scientists have sort of converged upon as like, okay, we think these are kind of reasonable um, components of play. Now, whether or not this is like everything about play, it's probably not the case. But um, what we see is that play is not completely functional. So what that means is like, you don't see a direct benefit from the play behavior. Um, it may be similar to a serious behavior. And so in a lot of animals, we think of play as the opportunity to practice for real life skills. That could be uh, practicing behaviors that will help you in hunting or foraging. That could be uh, behaviors that will help you interact with other members of your species, whether you're fighting or playing or protecting your territory. But the things that seem to de define play are that it is spontaneous and pleasurable. So the animal appears to be having fun, that it is repetitive, right? So like this bird, it happens over and over again. And the other criteria that he um, posited was that it should be present when an animal is not stressed. And the reason that we think animals show play when they're not stressed is that they feel safe enough to engage in these behaviors. So you're in an, an environment where you can take some risks. You can play with that branch. You can um, roll around with your sibling and you're not that concerned about being hunted or having to hunt to survive. So really this idea is that play is something that we see again throughout the animal kingdom, not just captive animals, but in wild animals. 
and that it really should serve some sort of function. Like if it evolved and animals do it, then it should have positive beneficial um, effects. Now let's think about cats. So, so much of like my philosophy about play and why it's so important is that it is based in cats hunting behavior. And this is something that we don't always think about because a lot of us keep our cats indoors. So they don't have a lot of opportunities to hunt unless, you know, a fly happens to come into your house. And we often just, you know, throw our cats food down. They don't need to hunt to survive anymore. So we've kind of taken their jobs away from them, but we have not taken the instinct to hunt away from them. So if you think about when that fly comes into your house, probably most of you know your cat, when they see that fly, they are very excited. It is like the biggest event of the day. And that is because that hunting instinct is still intact. So even though cats are domesticated, we do consider them domesticated to some degree, we have not changed their behaviors like we have dogs. And dogs have been domesticated for a much longer time and have been domesticated and shaped for specific behaviors, right? That's why we have some dogs that are pointers, some dogs that are retrievers. And so for cats, we have not really asked them to change very much. We've just said, be cute and cuddly and come into my house. But as far as the hunting, yeah, okay, you, you still can do it if you go outside. And if you are inside, sorry, <laughs> there's no hunting opportunities. But when we look at play behavior, we see so many similarities between play and hunting that they are essentially the same functional thing. Cats are stock and ambush hunters. And it's important to know this because it affects how we play with them. A stock and ambush hunter, sometimes it's called um, ambush predator, um, you know, there's different terms for it, but in the carnivores, there's basically two types of hunting. There's the stock and ambush or stock and rush hunters, and then there's the pursuit predators. So canines tend to be pursuit predators. They're going to chase their prey until they get tired, and then they're going to um, basically overtake them. But that's not how ca cats hunt, right? So cats usually are triggered by some type of stimuli, whether it's the sound of like a mouse squeaking or a bird rustling in some leaves, and or the cat is going to go to a place where they know prey have been before. So there's certain things that might indicate, hey, there's some prey around here, like a mouse hole, <laughs> like a hole in your wall, um, a place that they've seen uh, birds fly to, like a bird feeder. Then they're going to wait. So they're just going to hang out and wait for the opportunity. And once they see the prey, sense the prey, smell the prey, hear the prey, they're going to sneak up on them and wait for the perfect opportunity to pounce. And so that can take a long time, right? And if you've watched cats hunting um, or you've played with your cat in a way that kind of resembles hunting, you'll see they kind of army crawl across the ground until they're at the perfect distance that they can reasonably expect that with one leap, they can capture the prey with their front paws as they leap and, and land on it. And usually they do this with their front paws and kind of strike the ground. And so there's a lot of waiting involved and not necessarily a lot of running, but there's a lot of thought process involved because they have to anticipate what the animal is going to do. They have to kind of calculate again, what's the perfect distance speed that I need to make this attack. And so when we think about how they hunt, it can sometimes help us with how we play. Because one thing I see a lot of people do when they're playing with their cat is they're kind of just waving the toy around really fast, really fast, really fast, and expecting the cat to kind of, you know, run a marathon in their living room and then be tired. But that's not really how cats hunt. So certainly some young cats especially will just run around after a toy. But as they get older, we do have to kind of focus more on the cognitive part of the hunting when we are playing with them. Um, I mentioned here, you know, live prayer introduced to kittens by mom. Um, it is not true that kittens need to be taught to hunt by their mom. They will learn how to hunt even if they're not brought up with their mother. Um, and that just tells us hunting is so important to cats that they have multiple ways to get there. And actually the best thing to help cats be a good hunter is practice. And the other thing to keep in mind, um, because we're very visual, so we're only thinking about what the toy looks like as it's moving around. But that's not what the cat is experiencing is most important. Their sense of hearing is very important. Their sense of touch, their whiskers are an amazing instrument that can detect ear movement and also the feeling of the prey. So when they're holding you know, a mouse, whether it's a toy or a live mouse in their mouth with their paws, their whiskers are sending them a lot of information about how much that mouse is struggling and moving around, 
Is it warm? Is it cold? Is it moving? And so it, one thing that I always encourage people to do is kind of just remember that how we experience the world is not exactly how our cats experience the world. We know that scent is very important to them. We know that that hearing is very important. And it's not that vision isn't important, but cats have very um, fuzzy vision up close. So when the toy is right in their face or they're holding it in their face, it's blurry. So the perfect distance for them is more like in the two to three meter range. That's where they are very sensitive to movement along the horizon. And anything closer than that is going to be a little blurry. Now, the other thing to keep in mind too is that they have very limited color vision. So movement is very important. Their very eyes are very sensitive to movement. They can detect things in low light condition that we cannot, but they probably don't care that much if the feathers on the end of the toy are red or blue. I mean, they do like blue and yellow. Those are colors they can see, but they just do not see things as vibrantly as we do. So a lot of times toys are more designed because we like the way they look and maybe not so much because of the functionality for the cat. If you think about it, most of the things that cats hunt are brown. <laughs> they like little mice and birds. Okay, so moving along. So my argument that cats play because they hunt is because there's all these overlapping mechanisms between hunting and play. And I'm gonna talk a little bit about some of them during this talk, but for example, um, we know that cats are more likely to hunt when they're hungry and they're more likely to play when they're hungry. And they're also highly influenced by the qualities of either the prey animal or the toy. So if something's too big, whether it's a rat or a toy, if they're not very hungry, it's not super attractive to them because large prey can be dangerous. Rats are actually pretty formidable um, adversaries for cats. They can damage, they can hurt a cat, they can bite them, they can scratch them. So cats much prefer mice. Mice are much less threatening. They're easier to catch and hunt. Um, but, you know, just keep in mind when you're playing with your cat as well, like it could be influenced by the same things that influence their hunting behavior, namely hunger and like the size or style of the, the toy or prey. Um, and we do recognize that play is part of the predation spectrum. Like most of you have probably heard like, oh, cats torture their prey. They play with the animals they're killing. They're cruel. And really um, what that's expressing is more hesitancy, like they're playing it safe. And so things that look playful to us when a cat is hunting. Um, so if you if you do happen to see, um, I used to uh, work somewhere and we had an outdoor kitty that hung out in our yard of the uh, place that I worked. And we would occasionally see her hunting and, and she would do all the like tossing and, you know, batting and all those things. And kind of a lot of head bobbing that looks very playful to us. But a lot of those behaviors are protected to the cat. If you bat at a mouse or, you know, rat a little tentatively, that's going to tell you how willing they are to fight back, how dangerous they are to you. Or you can move it so their head is away from your body. So if you do go in for the kill, they're less likely to turn around and bite you in the face. So the behaviors that we see as playful, I put that in quotes because it's really part of hunting and it's a, it's more a sign of the cat's hesitancy than they're like, I love torturing my prey, which unfortunately they kind of get a bad rap for like not just getting the job done, but they're really just trying to get the job done safely. I'm gonna talk briefly about how play develops in cats. So we see play in kittens at around three weeks of age. So that's when their eyes and ears are open. And they tend to be very focused on social play at that age because they are pretty much just hanging out in their nest with their litter mates. So social play happens first. And then a little bit later, we'll see object play. So object play tends to start around seven weeks of age when kittens are weaning. So that makes sense because when you're weaning, you're starting to learn to hunt. You're starting to become self-sufficient. Mom is directing you to the hunt if mom's around. And so now your interest is maybe less um, focused on just playing with your litter mates, but now it's playing with your litter mates and playing with small objects. So those small objects are going to be practice for um, killing real prey. If that's the route that the kitten is taking in their life, if they end up living in a home, then they're probably not going to do a lot of killing. Um, and kittens also exhibit locomotor play, which is just that kind of exploratory behavior, climbing on structures. So there's been research where they gave kittens structures to play on and just saw what they did and they all started climbing them as they got more skilled and um, you know they would occasionally fall down and just climb back up again but there was really no purpose of the climbing except to climb and have fun so it does seem like it was intrinsically rewarding to do that climbing and it was kind of a play exploratory behavior 
We know that play continues through the lifespan because most of us have adult cats who will play, but sadly there's very little research on play behavior in adult cats. So most of the research that has been done, and a lot of that research was done in the 1970s and 1980s, has been done on kittens. So we know quite a bit about how play behavior develops in kittens and what they do when they're playing. And I talk about this quite a bit in the book, but sadly um, there's just not as much about adult cats. So there, there are some gaps in our knowledge aside from our personal experience that to me are, you know, indicate we need more research in this area. When you look at social play in kittens, so I mentioned they started around three weeks of age and social play, so this is play with other cats or kittens, it stays quite high until 16 weeks of age. And the thing to keep in mind about this, I am a big proponent of adopting kittens in pairs because then they have a playmate. And if you think about when most people adopt kittens, it's in the eight to 12 week range. And this is a peak time of social play. So if you adopt a kitten to live as the only animal in their home, they're potentially going to have some problems because they're social. If there's no litter mates or other young cats to play with, their social play is going to be seriously impacted. And then we sometimes see that social play directed towards things like human hands, which we try to avoid encouraging people to rough house with their kittens because it can turn into a problem, especially when they're adults. So for me, it is a missed opportunity because kittens are so playful in that period until about four months of age. And also because we know that cats that grow up together are much more likely to stay friendly throughout their lifetime. So it's much easier to introduce kittens and have them stay friendly than try to introduce adult cats. I'm not saying it can't be done, but it is just more challenging and the relationships may not develop in the same way that cats who live together, grow up together will do um, if they have that experience from the time they're kittens. And then at about four months of age, social play does decrease. And that is probably reflecting kind of natural changes that happen in cats. Um, they would naturally be reproductive around that time. So they would disperse, they wouldn't stay with their family because um, they would wanna form families with other well, they don't form families, but they'd want to mate with animals that were not their siblings, so they would separate. And so we just see a lot less social co cohesion around the time that cats would naturally be becoming independent hunters. Um, so yeah, this is um, social play. And as I mentioned, the um, object play also happens during this period, but object play and social play are not related. So a kitten could be very, very into social play and less into object play, or they could really love both, but they're, they develop independently and they're not necessarily correlated. So you can have a cat who really loves to play with objects, does not like playing with other cats and vice versa. I mentioned that hunger can have an effect on hunting behavior. So if a cat's hungrier, it makes sense, they're going to be more likely to um, hunt. And if they're hungry, they're more likely to play as well. So this was a study done, done by um, John Bradshaw and Sarah Hall. And um, I'm just going to kind of walk you through what they did. Basically, they just had two groups of cats, cats who had either just eaten, so that's zero hours as the time since their last meal, or cats who had not eaten for 16 hours. So those cats were presumably very hungry. They would offer the cats two types of toys, either a small toy or a large toy, and then they just looked at how often they interacted with the toy. So if they had just eaten, um, they were equally likely to interact with the small toy, which is this black bar, as the large toy. But if they were very hungry, they were much more interested in the large toy. So they were sniffing it um, and interested in interacting with it. However, if you look at the biting, so the second graph is how often they would bite the toy. If they were less hungry, they were more likely to bite the small toy. And hmm, if they were very hungry, they were also more likely to bite the small toy. So if we think like the difference between a mouse and a rat, what this tells us is that cats are much more likely to bite something that's small, whether they're hungry or not. If they're not, um, if they're very hungry, then they're a little more willing to sniff the larger toy, but they're not still not feeling great about biting it. So again, this kind of reflects the similarities and this perfectly reflects the um, data from a separate study where someone tested hunting and basically mice or rats um, with how hungry the cat was. So what we see again is just, they're much more interested in biting the small toy regardless of how hungry they are, but they're more willing to sniff the toy if it's large and they're hungry. So again, the large toy is a little more intimidating. If they're hungry, they're interested in sniffing it, but not as certain about biting it. Okay, so we have a poll question. 
Um, this is another John Bradshaw study, and um, this is about the effect of habituation. So habituation is the tendency that we have to stop responding to something. And when I consult with clients, I hear this all the time, um, that there are people say, oh yeah, my cat seems to get bored of their toys. And I'm seeing that a lot of you have the exact same experience. <laughs> so we've got, uh, yeah, consistently around 85 or so percent. Um, all right, we're gonna let a few more responses come in. All right, so we've got, yeah, 83% of you say, yes, your cat gets bored of their toys. And science supports you. You are not crazy. <laughs> this is something, this is a real phenomenon that happens with kitties. So let's talk about the research. And then during my talk, I'm going to talk about how do, how do we handle this knowing. So to me, it always helps when I know that, okay, this has been proven by science. Like this is um, something that is a real effect because then people can prepare for it. Because I think what people don't know how to do is like fix, fix this. So, um, okay. So the, um, and this is one of the illustrations from the book that Lily Chin did. Um, so this is a visualization of the study. So basically what they did was they had a toy on a string and they would present it to a cat. Um, then they would take a break and then they would present the toy, the same toy to the cat again, take a break, present the toy to the cat again, take a break, and then present a new toy to the cat on the fourth trial. So they had three trials with the same toy. So in this case, we'll just say it's a white fuzzy puff on the end of a string. And at first the cat's very interested in the toy, like this is great. By the third time the same toy has been interested, the cat is like, yeah, I'm not interested in this toy at all. But on trial four, they introduced a toy that was identical in every way, except it was a different color. <laughs> and so it was a new toy, it wasn't the same one. And the cat was interested again. And so let's look at some of the graphs of the data. So they actually did three permutations of this study. So the first graph, which is here in the upper left-hand corner, is looking at the biting behavior and the grabbing behavior. They called it clutches and kill bites. And so on the um, y-axis, we have the, um, sorry, the x-axis, we have the uh, frequency. And on the y-axis, we have the session. So on the first session, so again, they just introduced the toy and we can see there's a lot of biting and a fair amount of clutching. But by session three, the cat is barely biting the toy at all and they're barely clutching it. So the cat is clearly bored of the toy. Now remember on session four, they introduce the new toy, the clutching increases and the bites are way up. So this, um, this indicates that the cat has um, renewed interest in playing. This was with 25 minute intervals and these were with cats in a laboratory. So in experiment two, they experimented with different um, lengths of intervals. So they did five minutes, 15 minutes and 45 minutes. But what we can see is the same pattern emerges regardless of how much time was happened in between introducing the toy, whether it was 25 minutes, 15 minutes, 45 minutes, the same thing happens. The cat is initially interested in the toy, but by the third time they've interacted with that same toy, barely interested at all. And when they bring out a new toy, the cat is excited again. And then experiment three was with cats in a home environment. So they validated that not only were the laboratory cats losing interest in the toy, but cats in homes were doing the same thing. And this was independent of how long you waited. Um, but the one thing about the five minute interval is that it did seem like there was a boom um, on trial four with that new toy. The cats did seem a little more excited than the laboratory cats. So the overall like lesson from this is that yes, your cat does get bored of the same toy and that does not necessarily mean they're done playing or that they're bored with play because we can clearly see that again and again, when a new toy is introduced, the cat's interest in playing is increased. And so this is really important when we're playing with cats. I switch out toys during a play session with my cats two, three, four times, sometimes more. It really depends on what they're feeling and how I'm feeling, but just keep in mind that it's not you, your cat is bored um, and switching a toy may be a great way to bounce back from a play session that seems to be lagging. Okay, the last bit of research that I wanna to touch on is by um, Sarah Hall, who also did the um, previous study with um, habituation and this is related. She, um, so this isn't, this isn't a scientific experiment. This was a theoretical um, chapter she wrote about the things that motivate play in animals. And it made a lot of sense to me because I see a lot of cats who like to shred toys and bite things. And a lot of times when we spend, you know, 
buy $10 on a toy, we want it to last. We don't want it to fall apart right away. Um, but from the cat's perspective, if you think again about hunting behavior, if you are hunting something, and this is a little gross, but if you're killing something, say a bird, um, there are going to be feathers flying off the body. The body's going to be changing temperature. There's going to be some blood. There's going to be some tissue damage. That tells you as a hunter, keep going. You've got this. You're killing this bird. And so for cats, it's very likely that they also like that the thing they're playing with changes in form because that is a cue that they're killing it and that they're successfully killing it. And so if they keep biting at the toy and nothing changes about it, their brain and body is saying, hmm, like either this prey is not prey or like this prey is too strong for you. So it's good to at least incorporate some types of toys that your cat can destroy. So I'm a big fan of like craft paper, the stuff that comes in your orders from your favorite online pet retailer, or you can buy it at a art store. But if your cat is the kind of cat that does this kind of stuff to cardboard boxes or this kind of stuff to your toilet paper, then um, you might want to think about um, incorporating some paper toys or cardboard toys into your repertoire so that they can really get that satisfaction of feeling what they're attacking change in physical form. I thought that was really cool. Like I hadn't really thought about this concept until I read this chapter and it just made a lot of sense to me. Okay. Um, so I'm going to just touch briefly on the why of play. Um, I've kind of talked a lot. I hopefully have convinced you that, you know, there's some similarities with hunting behavior. And so this is an instinct that cats have and play is an outlet for that instinct. And when I think about like kind of cat well-being, it really is about um, these frameworks that have already been developed related to animal welfare. And welfare is really this concept that an animal has the ability to cope with stressors in their environment, and that they have an appropriate balance between um, you know, negative experiences and positive experiences. And that if there are negative experiences, they have the ability to cope with them. They have choices in their environment to escape those negative experiences. And when we're thinking about, and you know, to, to be fair, a lot of these um, ideas around animal welfare were developed for um, animals like in production, right? Like agricultural animals. That was really where the five freedoms came from. You may have heard of that. Um, that was like freedom from pain and freedom from hunger. And the problem with early animal welfare models is that we're, they're really about not letting animals have bad experiences, which is important. But they didn't really talk about the things that animals need to be happy. It was just like, make sure they're not in pain, make sure they're not hungry. Well, how about we make sure that they're happy? How about we make sure they feel safe and have emotional, like emotionally positive experiences? And probably most importantly, that they have the opportunity to express behaviors that are specific to them as a species. And so for cats, when I think about like what things allow cats to be a cat, one of the big ones is of course, playing and, and hunting. And so the, um, Five Pillars of a Healthy Feline Environment, which I talked about in my talk for AMC last year, um, is a model for what cats need to have an environment that they can thrive in. And there are five pillars, um, as the title says, um, but I just want to point out that opportunities for play and predatory behavior are one of those five pillars. So it's like in the top five things your cat needs for a healthy environment. So that's, um, that's like, it, it, you know, experts have converged on these things are very important for a cat's um, health and well-being, and also recognizing that physical health and emotional health are connected. And um, you know, I think we often think like, well, yeah, my cat needs food, my cat needs water, my cat needs to go to the vet once a year, and my cat needs a nice cozy bed. But we're not really thinking about like maybe the emotional things that they need, the mental stimulation they need to be happy. So. This is my pitch for play as a way to give your cat good welfare. And this is further supported just from like research and other animals. Like I mentioned, there's there's really not as much research on cat play behavior as I would like to see. Um, but you know, we know that in other species, like play and enrichment are really important to physical and emotional health. They help reduce stress. And we see that cats play less when they're stressed. Um, there's research supporting that declawed cats are less likely to play, which indicates that if you have um, any compromise in your welfare, that you are not as likely to play. So cats in a shelter environment 
are less likely to play, especially at first. So, um, so this all kind of ties into this. Um, we want to play with our cats to help them not be stressed. And when they are stressed, they're less likely to play. So then we know that there's perhaps some indicators that there's a, there's an issue if our cats are not playing. Okay. So what we do know, so, you know, I, I, I think there's, and certainly in the scientific paper I wrote with Julie Hecht, we talked a lot about what, what is missing in the research. And there's a lot missing in the research that we don't know about cat play behavior, but we know enough um, even with the gaps to, I think, safely say that there's a lot of great things about play. We should be doing it with our cats regularly. Um, and that, again, recognizing that cats' bodies are optimized for hunting, they have all these senses that help them hunt, and that there's this overlap between hunting and play behavior, that this is a good outlet for a natural behavior, um, especially for indoor cats. Although, as I argue in my book, Play is important for cats who have outdoor access too. So it's not just something we do because we keep our cats indoors. It's something we do because it helps us provide a good home for our cats, provide them with exercise and mental stimulation, and provide us with a way to have a great relationship with our cats. I see play as a really great way to bond with your cats and establish a routine with them and provide them with things they need in the house, which even if they go outside, your home is likely their main territory where they feel safest and most comfortable. And the last thing I'll just say in argument is like, you know, I am a proponent of use it or lose it. I've definitely worked with clients whose cats were experiencing something akin to like learned helplessness or apathy and had maybe lost interest in interacting with their environment. So it's really important to keep your cat engaged, whether it's through play or training or um, food puzzles or a bird feeder to watch, but really providing them with a stimulating environment is, is important for their well being. And, you know, my last kitty who, she died at about 16 and a half years of age, but she played until just a few weeks before she died. She had cancer, so she did eventually decline and not, she wasn't as interested in play in her last few days, but she, right up until then, she was interested in play. So she, it wasn't like, you know, she wasn't doing backflips or anything, but she was still getting really into the toys. So um, don't think that just because your cat's a senior that they cannot enjoy play. Okay, so now we're gonna get to the fun part of the talk, which is some of my tips for effective play. Um, this was my kitty I was just talking about, um, Clarabelle. She passed away in 2020, but she was a great player for her whole life. This was her when she was about a year old. Okay, so tip number one is pick the right toy. Now research on cat hunting has shown that some cats are specialist hunters, meaning that they have one type of prey they really love, and um, that could be birds or it could be mice or bugs or snakes, but they tend to hunt the same thing as long as that prey is available. Then you've got the cats who are generalists and it's like, if it moves, they'll go for it. So we tend to see that some cats are very, like I like said, real strong feelings about a prey type or a toy type. And then other cats just like, if it's moving, I will chase it. So our next poll is, is your cat a specialist or a generalist? So what's your cat's favorite prey or toy type? All right, I'm seeing um, there's a lot of movement in the voting. This is very exciting. Got uh, the mice are pulling ahead aside from generalist. Definitely you've got about a third of your kitties are generalists. So they like anything that moves. And then mouse and bird is pretty much neck and neck. Okay, can you all see the results? Is this posting for everybody? I think so. Right okay, great. Good. So we've got, yeah, like I said, about a third of you, your cats like anything that moves. We've got 23% mice and birds tied. Um, and so this is a, a little frame from the handout that I did with Lily Chin, which I will um, again provide you with a link to later. But these are just some toys that are really good at, in my opinion, mimicking some of these prey animals. So the de bird is great if your cat loves birds and feathers. The cat catcher is a really nice mouse-like toy. Cat dancer, the classic wire with a little bit of cardboard on the end is really good for, um, for cats who like bugs. And I love the bamboozler for snake-like toys. There's, there's other toys that fit these criteria. These were just ones that were um, kind of come to mind. So the other thing too is like every cat has to hunt to survive. So if there's not enough birds around, they will switch to other prey. So don't hesitate to try some different prey types for your kitty when you're playing. Um, but yeah, I would say um, important to recognize if your cat has strong preferences, like what toys are going to help them 
um, with that. Okay, number two, I've talked a lot about hunting. So this is probably no surprise that we should mimic the hunting experience. And you know, you've got it when your kitty does a little butt wiggle. Um, you can see this kitty, her eyes get really dilated right before she pounces. Um, but I love seeing this kind of behavior, the zoom and the butt wiggle. Um, but again, remember cats are stock and ambush hunters. So that may mean there's a long period where you're moving the toy very slowly, just like if you were a bird that is pecking in the, you know, in the, at the seed in the ground or a mouse kind of uh, rustling in some leaves. And cats are attracted to rustling sounds. So a big fan of tissue paper as a toy prop. Um, keep in mind their, their eyes are tuned into movement along the horizontal plane, as I talked about earlier. So that kind of two to three meters away is often a good sweet spot for starting the play. And again, remembering that for cats, it's, um, it's all about the like slow, long game. So, you know, I think sometimes people get bored of playing with their cats because they have to move the toy really slowly to keep the cat's interest sometimes, or it takes a really long time before the cat will actually pounce. So sometimes people give up, give up a little too easily. But again, a lot of times we're not just whipping the toy around. We're really trying to tap into the cat's stalking um, uh, instincts. And that can take some time. So definitely don't be afraid to move the toy slower than you think you should be. Because in my experience, that's often more successful than moving it around really fast. Okay. Um, so moving the toy. And this is something that when I worked at um, an animal shelter, I saw a lot of clients struggle with this. So people come in and meet a cat and we'd often give them a toy so they could play with the kitties in the shelter. And people didn't always know how to move the toy in a way that would engage their cat. So what I always recommend doing is like thinking like, what would a bird do? What would a mouse do? And if you don't know what a bird or mouse would do, there's tons of videos on YouTube of birds and mice. Like they're designed for cats. Um, watch those videos because think about like what birds do, right? They hop, they fly, they peck. Um, what do mice do? They like to like run along the corners of a wall and they like to hide under rugs. Um, lizards like to climb walls. Bugs like to fly around kind of erratically. So these are the kinds of movements that you can incorporate when you're playing with your cat to make it more hunting-like, make it a more real life experience for them. Um, what I definitely encourage people to do is like, think about like things a mouse would not do, right? So a mouse would never go up to a cat and like poke them in the face. And one thing I used to see in the shelter all the time is that people would take a toy and they would start touching the cat with the toy. And that would almost always get a reaction from the cat. So the person's like, oh yeah, he likes this. But no, it was an irritated reaction. The cat's like, oh, why are you doing this? But, and so maybe the cat would go into like a little biting mode or push the toy away, but it wasn't a play response. So just keep in mind, yeah, no, no bird or mouse is going to just walk up to a cat and poke them in the face. So think instead like what they would do, like they would try to get away, they would move away, they would move under something, they would try to hide. Um, you don't wanna make the play too hard or too easy. So a lot of this is, and, and I think really the point of my book is to try to encourage everybody to experiment, like try different moves, see what your cat likes best, try some new toys. Um, but don't be afraid to try something new and just see how it goes. And if it's a flop, don't do it again, but, or, you know, try something different next time, but really experiment to see what your cat responds to best. Like when, when you see your cat doing the butt wiggle and the pupils are dilated and they're locked in, you know, you're doing the right thing. And don't forget that again, they're using their sense of, of hearing. They're using their sense of smell. They're using their whiskers and sense of touch when they're hunting. It's not just all visual. Now I have some videos. So these are some good examples, um, in my opinion, of, of cat play. So um, this, this cat's fantastic. Um, and this is a, um, so probably a lot of you have played with the wiggle worm before, um, but it's just a, a little wormy on the end. But what I really like about this is when you've got a young cat and they're really going for it, is this kind of U-shaped movement of the toy is really good at getting backflips. So as you saw at the beginning, Cat's getting a little tired now. She did some pretty fantastic backflips at the beginning. So um, but <laughs> another kitty comes in. So we're gonna talk about two cat households or multi-cat households as well. But um, but yeah, don't be afraid to, to when you, especially when you get the young active ones to get the, use this kind of U-shaped movement of the toy to encourage some backflips. I'm a fan of backflips. Okay, here's some other, 
um, moves that I like. So on the left hand side, we've got the under the rug. So this is my go to when anything else fails is just move the stick end of the toy under the corner or something. Cats can't resist it's like a little mouse tail going under a rug. And um, again, like when I'm playing with my cats, I'm definitely like trying to not be in a rush because sometimes they're really slow, like to pounce. Um, and sometimes they're really like kind of lazy about it, but this is, this is play. Like it doesn't look like compared to the last video, this looks much more mellow, but this is still play. And yeah, just pardon. I have a lot of home videos. My home is sometimes a mess. Um, there's cat toys everywhere. It's just the way it is, <laughs> but, um, and you'll see, oh, other cats interested. I have three sisters, so they're pretty comfortable playing around each other. Um, but we try to give them some space during play, but now she's going to take her turn. And again, just moving it under the edge where it pokes out. Moving it very slowly. She can't resist. Usually right when it goes under. Boom. All right. I also, um, I have a hardwood. So carpet is good for certain types of play, especially if they're gonna be doing like backflips. And then I have hardwood floors. So I also, um, let me turn the volume down on this video. I like to use towels and blankets to um, allow my cats to do a little surfing. <laughs> So, and you can see the peacock feather, another favorite toy of mine. But yeah, she really likes to slide across the floor. Um, and then on the right-hand side, I don't know if you're familiar with the Snuggly Cat Ripple Rug. This is one of my favorite cat props for play. It's just, it's two mats. One of them has like backing on it so it doesn't slide around. And then it has Velcro on the top one and there's holes in it. And so it creates all these little like mouse holes, but your cat can also go in it. So it's great for moving a toy underneath inside these holes. Some cats really love to go in it. Some cats just like to poke their paws in it. Um, but there's there's all kinds of ways you can, and since it's got Velcro and it's these two separate pieces, you can kind of reconfigure it into different like depths. Um, but I've just found this is a fantastic way to enhance your play session is, again, you can see it's kind of sim similar to the moving the stick end of the toy. She's like, I'm a one trick pony, but it, my cats really like the stick end of the toy. Um, but yeah, she likes to get right in there. So anyway, I highly recommend the Ripple Rug if you have not tried it. It's a great toy. I have no financial investment in any toy companies. I just um, like things that work. And um, so many of my clients also love the Ripple Rug. It's just uh, really, like I said, fantastic prop. I don't leave it out all the time. So I'll put it away for several days. And then when I bring it out again, they're very excited. Okay. Um, okay, so changing it up. So as I mentioned before, we have research telling us that cats get bored of the same toy. So I do recommend having several interactive wands. And the nice thing about a lot of the interactive wands is that you can change out the lure on the end. So, you know, I recommend having a few wands that you like and then having more lures, the things that you hang on the end. And they can be homemade. So for me, um, I make a lot of my own lures out of paper, I go through the recycling, things that are safe for my cats to play with. Pretty much if it's small and safe, I will tie it to the end of a string and try it with my cats. And so um, I'm often, because my cats, like everybody else's, do get bored of their, their toys. I am constantly changing it up. A couple weeks ago, I put a decaf um, English breakfast tea bag on the end of, <laughs> of a wand toy. My cats loved it for one day and then they're bored of it. So I just put the tea bag in the compost bin. But um, so you never know what they're going to go for. But again, thinking about the like ability to shred it. So paper and cardboard can be really great things to just tie on the end of a toy. And my cats also really love um, green beans. So I just toss green beans around. I've tied a green bean to the end of a wand toy. She That's Ruby, she really loves green beans. And then uh, one day I found my cat Coriander, she was just rolling a potato around. So um, I don't know how she got the potato, um, but it was rolling around in our dining area. So, um, so you know, there are some things like you don't want your cats to eat garlic or onions. So some things are kind of off limits, but I've also 
taken like the end of a beat, which kind of looks like a, a mouse tail and tied it to a toy. Um, like I said, green beans. Um, I've known cats that have liked to play with baby carrots. I don't know if any of your kitties like, you should have done a poll. Does your cat like to play with any vegetables? But um, you can always, you know, add it in the comments if you want to. Okay, uh, meeting your cat where they are. So, you know, I think a lot of times when I was working with clients, they'd be like, oh, my cat doesn't like to play, um, especially for older cats, is that they didn't really recognize that if it didn't look like that first video where the cat was doing the backflips, then it couldn't possibly be play. And really for cats, sometimes it is like, they're just laying around. They don't feel like getting up. That's okay. We're still having fun. As I like to say, playing while laying is still playing. Um, and especially if you have like an older cat or if they're old, overweight or um, have any disabilities, then you're going to have to, you know, take it down a notch. You have a weaker predator. So the prey should be weaker too. So you're going to be maybe doing more ground play, maybe more slow play, but it's still play and you should still do it. If the cat's watching the toy and they're batting at it or just seem interested, that's more beneficial than not playing with them at all. And I have a whole section in my book about playing with special needs kitties of all types. So I, I really tried to address this pretty thoroughly, including like ways to set up the play space to make it easier for them. Okay, so um, so I have, as I mentioned before, I have three sisters. This is when they were kittens when we first got them. They were very cute. Um, they're very tolerant of playing around each other. And we have two humans in the house. So when we play, we try to take, you know, we're trying to manage different cat situations to prevent things like collisions. Um, so if you have multiple cats, you may not be able to play with them all in the same space at the same time because they might run into each other and you might spark a cat fight. And we definitely don't want to do that. But the other thing that's really important to keep in mind, and this is something I would hear all the time from clients when they had multiple cats was, oh, well, Fluffy just likes to watch Felix play. She doesn't really like to play that much. She likes to watch the other cat play. And most of the time, if they actually separated the cats, they would find that, no, Fluffy actually did want to play. It was just that Felix was a toy hog or she was too intimidated if Felix was playing. And so it's really important to recognize when the cats are inhibiting each other from playing and make sure that you allow them to have that separate playtime, separate play spaces so that everyone has the full opportunity to engage. Okay, this one is challenging for everybody, um, including me, which is to be present when you're playing with your cat. <clears throat> Excuse me. And I talk about this in my book, like, you know, an incident where I was not giving it my all and I kind of could tell my cat knew that I was not giving it my all. So I think the biggest one is like just thinking about like, okay, I'm going to dedicate this time to my cat and play with them. And that is going to mean um, putting my phone down for five or 10 minutes. And to be fair, I'm not like saying you have to play with your cat for an hour a day. Like for most adult cats, five to 10 minutes, once or twice a day is definitely great. Um, for younger cats, they need more. But for a lot of older cats, you, you do not have to, this is not like a second job for you. So, you know, I, I really encourage you to like be present when you're playing with your cat and have fun with it. And keep in mind too, that our cats really thrive off the routine. And so if you can play with your cat around the same time each day, that helps you make it a habit. And it also helps your cat anticipate it. So I think that's um, a great way to establish. So in our house, we always play after dinner. That's kind of the, um, we have like one definite play session after dinner. And then because we work from home, we try to sneak in like really short sessions a few other times during the day. So like, don't necessarily feel like this is a burden. Hopefully it's fun, but do try to be there and watch your cat's response to the toys. So you're seeing what they like and try not to be too distracted by your phone. Okay. Playing at the right time. So when we play can also have a big impact on how effective it is. And as I mentioned, cats tend to be more likely to play when they're hungry. So if you know, if you feed your cat, at, uh, if they're meal fed, then probably the best times to play with them is before you feed them. So just like we don't want to exercise on a full stomach, you're more likely to get play out of your cat before a meal. I also like to use play to encourage sleep. So I tend to play with my cats in the evening and feed them at my bedtime. So they're going to sleep through the night because that's very important to me. And sometimes we have to think about like, when is our cat naturally active? So most of you probably have um, a cat who gets the zoomies. And so um, if you know, oh, my cat tends to get the zoomies at 8 p.m., then that's a great time to play with them. And I do recommend playing, like I mentioned, you know, one to three times per day or more, but they, the play sessions can be relatively short. 
Now, one thing, and I touched on this on both the previous slide and this one is like really about fitting in the play. And I wanted to ask um, a poll question about what the biggest challenges are that you face with playing with your cats. So we have another poll. Do we have a poll? Yes. Okay. So what's the biggest challenge you have in not playing with your cat every day? And if it's other, feel free to share it in the comments. So a lot of you have a hard time making it a daily habit. And I get that for sure. And that's why, like I said, we have locked in. Playtime happens after dinner because that's really the only way. It's kind of like flossing my teeth. If I don't have it in a on a set routine, I will not do it. So um too busy, too tired. Yep, feel you. <laughs> cat not interested. So we've got about 17% of you whose cat is not interested. I'm hoping that you'll come away with some tips or that you'll buy my book and get more tips. Um, and yeah, too busy, too tired. You know, it is, um, we're all, we're all feeling like overwhelmed. I think we've all got a lot going on. Um, but hopefully, like I said, if you kind of have a refresh on like, what your cat needs to be happy and that this doesn't have to be a big thing, right? Just a few minutes a day can make a big difference. Okay, we're getting close to the end of the sesh. So I'm, I'm gonna zip through, we just got two more, which is um, cool down. So at the end of the play, just like when you're exercising, you wanna wind down a little bit, we wanna do the same thing for our kitties. This is a shelter cat. This video, I'm gonna age myself. I think this video is like from 2003. So this video is probably older than some of you that are here. But um, this was Haley. She was a nine-year-old cat in the shelter. Um, she was um, a kitty we were working with because she had some biting issues, but she got adopted and was great. But she was really into the DeBird. So this is the DeBird toy, which very bird-like, great for kitties who love birds. But what we wanted to do is like, because she had some tendencies to bite, we wanted to make sure that when we played with her, we let the toy kind of slow down at the end. So this is us just leaving the toy out. We're there to watch her. And then we just let her kind of calm down before we took the toy away. So that's a cool down is just letting the toy die and then letting the cat interact with it a little bit and then taking it away. And I like to offer cats a little snack after play because then it completes the hunting cycle where they would naturally eat if they killed something. Okay, and then the most important lesson is to have fun. So the last, this is just videos of cute cats and kittens. That's a cat dancer, so the, the wire toy with cardboard. Again, some of these videos are very old. This is one of my foster kittens many, many years ago. So cute. Um, yeah, very cute. His name is Orlando. Okay, this, um, again, just looking at some different toy movements. So that is also the cat dancer, I believe. No, I think it's actually a different toy. Um, but I think it's really good to see, to watch videos of cats playing so you can see what they do, what they like. There's a nice jump. This is my cat, Clarabelle. We loved the back of the couch as like a kitty highway. She really liked to go. We had the cat tree on either end, so we used to just go back and forth along the back of the couch as a way to tire her out. Here's some ground play and using furniture. So I like to use cat furniture as a way to move the toy behind like the, the legs of the furniture or in through so tunnels. <laughs> this is a nice snake-like toy. So that is like, there's a, it's called the cat charmer. Is um, It's like a little tie-dye fabric strip on the end. Oops, sorry. And um, a lot of cats really like this. This was, um, oh gosh, what was this kitty's name? So he was on recovery from, he had a broken leg. So he had to be cage bound for a while. And then when he was done with his confinement, he was very frisky. And um, so this was at the San Francisco SPCA where I worked many years ago. There's another bird. Back flips. Carrying the prey away. Probably you've seen this in some of your kitties. Oh, here's Haley again. I'm going to skip through Haley because we just watched her. Okay. This is again under the rug. This is a nice pounce. Incorporating the kitty furniture. So you can always get the cats to climb get more exercise, paper bags. Got to incorporate a paper bag into your play session every now and then. 
Kitties can hide in it, or you can hide the toy in it, move the toy under it. This kitty had no teeth, so just if you see her tongue hanging out, that's why. She was perfectly fine. <laughs> Again, using a toy to encourage some scratching behavior. And then I think the final. So this is another move I really like, which is moving a toy around the corner. So if you've got like some nice doorways, uh, molding in your house, you'll see as soon as the toy moves just out of sight, it becomes irresistible. Move it a little slow. Oh yeah, go get it. All right. So this is um, the handout that I did with Lily Chin. It's free to download on my website, um, which is whatyourcatwants.com, although I think the URL is actually different. So, um, oh gosh, if you can't find it, write to me and I'll send it to you. But um, it's been translated into 13 languages. It's free um, to distribute. Please download it, share it. If you work at a shelter, please um, feel free to share this with your clients. And if you just go to whatyourcatwants.com and click on, um, I think it's cat play handout, you will get here. But um, if you have any problems, just reach out to me. But yeah, this was um, super cute. It has some of my favorite tips for play and um, I just love the art that Lily did when, when she laid this out. And then that's it. So um, here's a QR code. If you are interested in ordering my book, here's ways to reach me. I'm on Instagram, probably the most active on Instagram. And I do try to post regularly on cat behavior and um, provide some useful information in addition to pictures of my cat, my cats. Um, so please feel free to follow me if you do the social media stuff. And um, I'm happy to take questions. Thanks for sitting through this. Oh my gosh. Thank you so much. This was fantastic. Um, and I can vouch that Instagram is fantastic too. So, um, but, and just letting everyone know all of these links we will send out tomorrow. Um, so if you didn't, weren't able to write them down, we promise we'll send them in the um, follow-up email. Um, so let's go through, I know a lot of, um, a lot of these questions, just having read your book, were covered, but let's go through, <laughs> okay. you know, some yeah. of these, especially um, the laser pointer. We have several oh, yeah. people asking yeah. about. So, okay. yes. Yeah. So they just want to know my take on the laser pointer. Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah. What's your opinion? Other okay. people had variation, but yeah, pretty much. Yeah. yeah. So, you know, I mean, I feel like the laser pointer is just one tool in your toolbox and it's definitely not, should not be the main one. So you know, the main issue is that it does, because your cat can never catch it, um, it can be frustrating. So we're not allowing them to complete, complete the hunting cycle or even like really engage in any part of a hunting cycle. And as I've told you, like there are many more senses that are important for hunting than just vision. And so the laser pointer is strictly just visual. So that's one issue I have with it. So I will say some cats, it really is the best way to get them off their butts and get them started. So I, I don't, I never say never. But if you are going to use it, I say um, end with a treat or a real toy and also try to follow the laws of physics because what I see a lot of people do is just they're waving the laser around and it just disappears and instead try to make it like go under a doorway or out a window or something. So it kind of acts like what a bug would do. Um, but usually when I start explaining like how to use a laser pointer, I just feel like I'm giving way too much um, like time to the laser pointer. And to me, it's just not not something I go to often. So I, I can't say, I, I would never say, I would not say never use it, but it's really like so low in the list of things I would try first that mm, it's okay. What you're saying, like, I, I think from your book, I'm going to um, to yeah. use something else and let the cat catch something, right? <laughs> I think you, you that's the ideal, it with but, right? you know, I mean, I have known some cats that really like the laser is the one thing that really gets okay. them excited you know we don't know and the, the other thing i should warn people is just that we don't know very much about how cats respond to it um you know a lot of dogs can become laser light obsessed and that's why there's a lot of concern about it there's less evidence for that in cats but there was a study that came out recently that showed kind of a connection between some um, behaviors like um compulsive behaviors in cats and, and laser pointer use they were also cats that tend to be really young and so one of the one of the measures of compulsive behaviors was tail chasing and a lot of young cats will play with their tails. So it's not necessarily like a slam dunk that laser pointers cause problems. But again, we see this in dogs. We should use it with caution in cats, I guess is what I would say. All right, great. Um, 
My one kitten loves to drop a ball toy by me in the evening for me to throw. He loves to chase it and then bring it back again. So I guess yes. the whole fetch, you know? Yes. Yeah. So I did not talk too much about, about fetch in the book because, you know, the process of writing a book, the book was fully written about a year and a half ago. Um, but what I can say, I'm working on a, I'm actually writing a scientific paper right now with some collaborators about fetch. So there was a publication that came out in the fall about fetch um, by, um, I don't know, I don't remember where the researchers were from, um, but, but what we know is that, yeah, some cats really do enjoy fetch, and it seems to be kind of this combination of social play and predatory behavior. Um, the three cats I have now are the first time I've had cats who fetched, so um, I've been enjoying a little fetch myself. Um, so yeah, have fun with fetch. It's very cute. <laughs> I think it was that paper they were saying they do it kind of on their terms or something. Yeah. <laughs> right? So that paper, that paper only, um, they only surveyed people who have a cat who fetch. So mm -hmm. we learned a lot right. about what fetching looks like. And it does seem like cats usually initiate it. So it's more successful if the cat initiates the fetch. Um, but what that paper could not do is kind of tell us the difference between the cats who do fetch and those who don't. And so that's something that uh, my collaborators and I are working oh, cool. on um, oh, that'll be in good. our research. So, yeah. Very cool. Okay. Yeah. This is this is a funny one. Um, interesting. We have a pet snake. So, so we don't, uh, wait, so we try not to introduce snake-like mm. toys to our cats. Yeah. Um, they're not out, but at the same time, there is no interaction with our actual snake. So does that make sense? If, yeah. Like yeah, I mean, as the same. <laughs> it's interesting because there's, you know, I, I talked about some of this like old, old research in kittens. And there was this weird study where they basically raised kittens with different, um, with rats. And they found that those kittens were much less likely to kill rodents later. Um, so there is some evidence for like the effect of socialization. But that said, I would never, never, never trust a cat with an animal that was their natural prey like it's just asking for trouble you don't I mean as someone who like one of my cats did kill my roommate's hamster many years ago and it was a complete like it was really sad and it happened it was not anybody's intention the hamster got out of their enclosure and so it was um really sad so even you know I I get nervous when I see people like with their like a cat with a bird sitting on it on the internet I just think there's a lot of yeah. um it's just taking a risk that is not worth taking in my opinion. So yeah, I think it's fine to not play with your cat with snake-like toys. It probably wouldn't like make your cat be like, oh, I got a taste for snakes. I'm going to go over mm -hmm. to the snake cage. But it's, you know, I think it is um, something you probably don't need to encourage, especially if your cat likes other toys. Great. Okay. Um, we had a question earlier on um, about how you were saying you showed the one toy and playing and playing, getting bored, and then the darker or different color toy. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And the person was saying, well, I thought that color wasn't as important. So they had that question. Just now. Yeah. So that's a great question. So um, what I think was probably going on was, you know, and so the toy, the reason they switched the color was just um, like to see if the color was what impacted it. But they also did a version where they didn't change the color. And, you know, basically I think it was probably the smell that, um, the fact that, okay, by the time the cat has bitten this toy three times, you know, in three different sessions, it smells familiar. And so I'm guessing that the novelty of the new toy was not necessarily the color, but possibly that it smelled fresh, like the cat had not okay. um, killed it already but it's a really it's a really great question and I wouldn't say that color doesn't matter because I mean it's not like cats don't see like shades or, or differences so it would visually look different and so it's just that to them um like a red toy does not look red it looks gray and like other colors are just going to look drabber to them than they do to us because their eyes are structured a little differently they don't have as many cones which are the color sensitive cells in the eyes so it's, yeah, it's not that they can't discriminate between colors. It's just, they're not vibrant like they are to us. I got it. Yeah. yeah. Um, okay. We had several questions, which again, I know you go into in the book, but just about the, you know, senior cats. This one is if my yeah. senior kitty still likes to watch the toy, but isn't as mobile as she used to be. Is she still enjoying it or is it teasing her with something she can't physically do anymore? Yeah, so um, I'm definitely in favor of allowing them to watch it, and you could bring it closer to her and see if she wants to bat it with her with her paws or whatever. And of course, nowadays we are increasingly recognizing that a lot of senior kitties benefit from some pain treatment for joint disease. So I would definitely talk to your veterinarian and make sure that your kitty is not experiencing anything that might be impairing their ability to play. But um, yeah, I think it's okay to, like I said, kind of just bring the toy to them or let them sniff it if they want to and um, let them interact with it. But I think if they're watching it, that's a positive thing for sure. Like they're engaged and um, yeah, it's just 
the play does start to look a little bit different when they get older okay right but they still like the play right yeah. they still do like the yeah. play yeah mm -hmm. um okay we have a question from um uh, dr two who we know as well dr um yeah Andrea two um Hi. she's saying hello to you she, you crossed you know in, in, uh, paths before um she's saying can you comment on what your your favorite toy for those of us in New York apartment that live in small mm. apartments and can't use the bird without breaking something. Okay. And I do talk about this in, in the book because yeah, ideally you have like a space where you can allow for a toy like the de bird to, um, you know, for those backflips and stuff, but yeah, um, not everybody has that space. So when I'm thinking about, you know, I'm working with a client, you know, when I was in the Bay area, a lot of people had small apartments. So I'm always thinking like, how can we use the play to go vertical, right? So using the furniture in your house, using the cat trees, using your, you know, the couch freeway, as far as the toys, I mean, aside from the debird, I mean, there's just the, you know, feathers on a stick, like you don't have to necessarily be like doing backflips, but you can be again, moving it under a rug or something. Um, I mean, I, it's hard to say. I mean, there's toys that I definitely love and there's also toys that other people's cats love that my cats are not interested in. So I, I am a fan of like, I really wish there was a place where we could like swap toys with other cat people so that like, oh, my cat's bored of this toy. Can you try it and see if your cat loves it? But, um, but you know, it is really just, um, experimenting, but I do love, you know, cat dancer. I love the rompy cats, which used to be ne Neko flies. Um, I love, I mean, honestly, I just love like a stick with a string on the end. Sometimes my cats, it doesn't even need a toy. It's just like a string on the end of, of a stick. They're fine with that. So um, really like experimenting and like I said, homemade toys are often the way to go just from like the whole novelty thing. Um, but yeah, I love um, the bamboozler is great. Um, like I said, cat charmer, cat catcher, cat dancer. Um, the DeBird company has a few, other, like they have several attachments. I'm a fan of all of them. So I would say, you know, try a few other ones. Um, but, you know, to me, that question is really about like, how do I work with a small space? And so it's not necessarily the toy, but like, how can I use like, maybe your hallway is a great, you know, space where you can get from the living room to the bathtub and you're gonna play in the bathtub and then you run to the living room, get them to go up the cat tree, right? So we're really just taking advantage of the small space by thinking vertically and using hallways to add to the fun. Hopefully and you know, we'll helps. send everyone the link to your awesome presentation from last year, which was how to make oh, your cat yes. happy, which you talked yeah. a lot about that using space really well. Yeah. So we'll yeah. get everyone and watch that one too. It's really, it's really great. Um, let's see. So we had several people, I just want to address this a little bit, is just asking if, can it be too intense or what if your cat is mm. breathing heavy? And obviously you want to check with your veterinarian, right? Yes. Just like yeah. if, yeah. that. Yeah. I mean, I talk about this in the book too. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I mean, I don't want to keep saying buy the book, but um, no, I know. I know. if you can't long. afford to buy the book, ask your library to carry it. But mm -hmm. um, I do cover this in the book because um, certainly, um, you know, you always want to you know, I, I think I, to quote the book, like ask your veterinarian if your cat is healthy enough for play, right? Um, which is um, kind of a, a take on the Viagra um, ads, but, um, <laughs> but <laughs> um, you know, my cat had a congestive heart failure and, you know, I asked my, the first question, like, can I play with her? And he was like, yeah, to, you know, let the patient dictate the pace of the play. But obviously, um, you know, my cat Ruby, when she was a kitten, she would play until she start panting and she would yeah. not only get like physically worked up, but I felt like she was mentally like worked up. And so we would have to like, kind of give her a little like breather, like, okay, you're too like, we'd have to separate her from the other two cats. Cause she was just a little too worked up. So, so yeah, some, you know, that's why I talked about the cool down. Um, you know, again, if your cat does have any type of um, respiratory or heart disease, you definitely want to ask your vet about like how much exercise they can take. And that's when you might want to do more like playing on the ground and less backflips, right? Less climbing. So you do have to kind of tailor it to your individual cat's preferences, their health needs and their abilities. Um, and so, but we can easily, like you can increase the cardiovascular activity by going vertical and making them run up to the top of their cat tree and down again and up on the couch and, you know, over to the kitchen table. If your cats are allowed on the table, like mine are, um, and then okay. if your cats are older and less active then you, you know, maybe you play mostly on the couch or just on the floor and you keep it very low to the ground. You're not moving the toys. You're not flying around as much. You're maybe more crawling or slithering. So, um, so yeah, I think, um, I do try to address all of these things in my book, but, um, but yeah, really just, um, 
again, encouraging a little experimentation, but if your cat does have special needs, health issues, just ask your veterinarian how much activity they can have. Certainly like a cat who had hip dysplasia, you probably won't want to be doing a lot of backflips or jumping. So, so it's always important to take your individual kitty's needs into consideration. Okay, great. Um, so this, I know your, your book, which is great talks, this focus is really on interactive play. Yes. What if um, we have a question, my cat, 14 years old, seems to enjoy playing with um, his mice more, more by himself mm -hmm. than we get involved. Does that play count or should we try to initiate play? Yeah. I mean, the book is really like about interactive play and it is to me because we're really allowing the cat to fully express their hunting behavior. Right. And so one thing about hunting is you don't know hundred percent what that mouse or bird is going to do. Right. Cause they're doing their own thing. And so when we're moving the toy, we're adding that element of the unknown, which is much more similar to hunting as opposed to if you push the mouse and chase the mouse, you kind of know what the mouse is going to do. You know what, how much force you need to move a mouse. And I'm not saying that um, that type of play is bad, um, but what I'm, what I am advocating for is a few minutes a day of interactive play. And by that, I mean, there's a human with a hand holding a toy mm -hmm. and a cat at the other end, right? So it really is to me that relationship. And um, again, the ability to um, really kind of let loose imagination wise. I mean, I'm sure for cats, you know, and this is a question like, do they know it's a toy? I talk about this in the book too. And like, yeah. kind of like, you know, how much belief do they have to suspend to, um, yeah. to play? And I think for some cats, it's very easy to just like, oh, that seems like a prey item. I'm going to chase it. And other cats are more like, hmm, that's not a bird. Like, I know I can see your hand at the end of the toy, right? Like some cats are a little more skeptical. And so again, kind of just considering the individual, but you know, what I would say is if your cat's older and likes to play on their own, that's great. But also, you know, try the stick under the end of the rug and see what they do. <laughs> Hopefully they'll okay. um, like a little bit of interactive play too. Like ideally cats do some of both. Okay, great. Um, okay, thoughts on catnip. I know that's the... I love catnip. Yeah, um, okay. <laughs> actually, I love Silvermine more though. Um, so okay. there, I'm, I'm a big fan of olfactory um, enrichment for cats. You just have to know how they're going to respond. So some cats get really mellow and some cats get really wound up. And so um, keep that in mind, like as far as like if your cat's the kind of cat that gets wound up on silver vine or catnip, you probably don't want them to use it together because they might start a fight or you don't want to pet them when they're, you know, getting into it. So, um, but it can be a great, added, you know, addition to your play life with your cat. Yeah, I'm a fan. Okay. Um, we have a question about hair elastics and I would say, oh yeah, no, no. <laughs> so I talk about that in the book too, because, um, cats love hair ties. Um, cats love, um, some things that are really dangerous and hair ties are one of them. So, um, I do not, I mean, everyone in the veterinary community is like, mm -mm, cause they know that hair ties mm -hmm. can lead to dangerous obstruction. So, um, I do harp a bit on safety and cats probably like hair ties while well, they're, they're springy, they move, they're, they're light and they probably, they smell like our hair. So they probably have an attractive scent, um, but that does not make them safe. So if you are going to use hair ties, um, which I don't really recommend, you could, for example, attach it to a wand toy securely and supervise, um, which if you're ever using a wand toy, you should be there. You should never leave a wand toy alone with your cat. Again, I talk about this in the book. But um, in general, yeah, I, I would say don't encourage play with it, kind of like you don't want to encourage play with a pet snake. Um, it's really just the risk is high and um, for a dangerous obstruction, I've had clients who had to shell out thousands of dollars to get an earplug out of their kitty's stomach. So you really want to be careful about what you let your cat play with. We, we see them every day. Yeah. So, yeah. yeah. Um, string and rope. No good to it. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah. These um, things should not be left alone mm -mm. with cats. And and in any interactive toy with a wire or string or anything similar should be put away when you're not supervising. Um, okay, so it's interesting. What about the giant hamster wheel? Yeah, For you know, um that is like I would put that more in the other types of enrichment. And mm -hmm. some cats really seem to like it. And um at the same time, I see a lot of hamster wheels on Facebook marketplace. So I think not all kitties like them. So it's a very individual thing. To me, it's 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 an expensive experiment. So if you can find one used, um, that's great. I definitely have known some cats that just really seem to like going in them and getting that out of their system. So, you know, if you have the space and the money, it's and the very active kitty, it may be worth a try. Okay. Um, what about, uh, yeah, 
toys that chirp or or bells or mm. noise yeah yeah so I, I talk about this in the book I too. Um, <laughs> Sorry, I don't want to give away to, no, the no, whole no. book, but yeah. there's plenty um, more. But people. yeah, <laughs> depends on the cat. Some cats seem okay. to like them and other cats don't. They can be scary for some cats. Um, they can be loud. So it really depends on your kitty. But, you know, I think with anything, if you have cats, you know that you're going to buy some things for your cats, um, like fancy beds and they're going to lay on the floor. Um, that's what my cats, I got them one of those nice fancy anxiety beds. I hated it. Um, so, you know, there's just some stuff they're not going to be into. And that's kind of, that's why you have friends with cats and hopefully one of them will have a cat who likes it instead. Okay, great. I, I believe we talked about this again, but just, um, it should toys be put away other than playtime. Yeah. And I, um, I talk about the book, some, some, I have some organization tips in the book. That's all I'll say. <laughs> okay, great. Um, Okay, let's finish on this one, which is kind of goes back to the vegetable question. Mm. And I know in your book, you said, don't scare your yeah. cat. And, you know, yeah. I, I'm just thinking back to oh, that. Cu those oh, cucumbers. Is a cucumber yeah. question? So let's, okay. yeah. <laughs> What's the question? <laughs> oh, I'm just saying, what, oh. what, what do you make of those videos that were, oh, you know? Oh, mm, yeah. Um, so, you know. Um, and this I'm is an idea I'm of scaring, which, which I like how you said, don't do that. <laughs> Yeah, I'm traumatized by a lot of things I see people do with their cats on videos on social media. So um, yeah, I am um, I find a lot of those videos just stressing. And I do talk about, um, just to keep this focused on play, is like some toys, you know, especially if you have a shy kitty, um, very nervous kitty, um, like a big toy that's got a lot of feathers and bells is going to be scary for some cats. And you never want to scare your cat during play. So, you know, it is important to um, introduce toys like slowly, quietly, let them sniff it and, you know, not be too like rowdy in your movements. Um, but yeah, the point is not to, to scare our cats. And, and also, again, keeping in mind what we know from the research, right? Like we know that some cats are um, intimidated by rats. So a bigger toy is going to be more intimidating in general. Even if your cat's hungry, they're going to sniff it, but not be as likely to bite it, right? That's what that study showed. So it, keeping that in mind, like just be sensitive and, and know your kitty and don't startle them with a toy. So like, you know, if you have a loud toy, maybe start it in the other room and let them kind of be like, mm, what's that? As opposed to like, you know, they're sleeping and you're waving this thing with bells in front of their face. So, you know, recognizing that, you know, if your cat's resting, you don't necessarily want to like startle them and try to get them to play they may not be in the mood and and really just um you know and it is I think one of the I have like some golden rules for play and that was one of them was don't scare the cat so try not to scare your cat don't leave a cucumber behind them don't startle yeah. them on purpose um for social media likes like let's be respectful and kind to our cats okay one more question okay so yeah. about the kibble that their cat likes food what do you think about including food and in play I love including food and in play. So, you know, I, I'm a big fan of food puzzles. I spend a bit of time in the book talking about the use of food puzzles. And, you know, one of my cats, um, she loves to chase kibble. I'll just throw it down the hallway and she'll run back and forth. Sometimes she never, she's never run as fast as she has for a piece of kibble. So, um, <laughs> so yeah, it's totally fine to incorporate food in the play. I love ending the play session with, with food. So there's, there's a few ways you can incorporate food into your play for sure, which okay, is, great. you know, makes sense. Yeah. Okay, awesome. Um, well, we've gone a bit over, but thank you for for um staying with us. Yeah, um, thanks everybody. Is everyone staying. is saying, yeah, thank you all. Um, let's see. I mean, really, your dedication to your field is so inspiring. I can tell how how passionate you are. Um, and just we're so grateful for the knowledge you've shared with us today. Thank you again for your time and this fantastic presentation. Um, just thank you, Kimberly Young, for all of the work that you did organizing this and all of our events. You're just you know, I'm so lucky to have you as my partner in all of this. And thank you. Um, and then thank you to all of you. Um, we are so grateful for you for just your um, for your time tonight and just for the support that you give to our events. Um, again, we'll send this out tomorrow so you can watch it again. And if you miss anything, we'll also send out some resources. Um, and just a quick mention, our, our next event is April 4th um, at 6 p.m. It is um, uh, cognitive dysfunction syndrome in senior pets um, nice. with um, Cornell veterinary behaviorists. Um, and we have that information on our website and in our newsletter that goes out tonight. So thank you all again, everyone. Thank you again, um, Dr. Delgado. So thank grateful you. for everything. And we will see you all again next time. Have a great night. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye.